I'm Marty Stauffer, here in Canyon Country. Solitary, silent, and seemingly empty, these vast spaces are like the bare skeleton of Earth's long history. This area was once covered by an ocean. Now it's high and dry. Time seems to stand still. But this land of stone and sand can hardly be called dead. Rain falls, rivers rise and cut their way through rocky depths. Wind blows, eroding colorful stone into beautiful shapes. Seasons come and go, and some of Earth's hardiest and yet most fragile plants and animals remain to give the canyons a sparse, serene, and strangely seductive life of their own. Here, even more than most wild places, the mind and spirit feel free. Here, there's no need to ask what's it good for. It's good for itself. And for all the living things that nature has spent millions of years evolving into canyon creatures. This land seems unchanging and peaceful. Yet it has taken millions of years of violent uplift and relentless erosion to create the timeless variety of canyon country. Nowhere on earth is this process more dramatically visible than in seven special areas of our Southwest. In Utah, we find massive Zion and intricate Bryce, the mysterious mazes of canyon lands and arches, and to the south, the half-hidden beauty of Glen Canyon. Further south, in Arizona, is the majesty of Monument Valley, and most spectacular of all, the mighty Grand Canyon. Each of these places is unique, and each is alive with its own specially adapted creatures. <coughs> the Cooper's hawk and these gambles quail range over a wide area of the southwest. But here, they must live a little differently in a dizzying world that's tilted almost 90 degrees toward the vertical. One quail is left to go on alone. The other becomes part of the life of the hawk. Predation is as ancient and natural as the forces that shape these canyons.
The great brooding cliffs of Zion are the eroded remains of a petrified desert. Chipmunks are generally quick and agile, but these cliff chipmunks must be even more so. Farther to the east, the morning sun rises, slowly warming the brilliant rocks of Bryce Canyon. This fantastic landscape is not a canyon at all, but the worn down edge of an ancient plateau. Like a canyon, however, its towering cliffs shelter a host of wildlife such as this golden mantled ground squirrel, which uses its cheek pouches to transport its winter food supply to a storage crevice in the rocks. These intricate spires and pinnacles may seem empty and endless, but they add a whole vertical dimension of living space for animals and birds, just as do trees in the neighboring mountain forests. Largest members of the crow family, these ravens mate for life. Each spring, they perform amazing aerial courtships. Some of the strangest effects of erosion can be seen throughout canyon lands and nearby areas, such as here in Goblin Valley. Although this country looks dry, water is the main eroding force. Sudden downpours wash away the softer layers of sandstone and sculpt the rock into shapes that can make a human being feel dwarfed and out of place. Nowhere is it more evident that the chain of life begins with water. Sparse plant life grows where moisture collects, near potholes. The plants shelter rodents and other small creatures, which in turn become food for larger ones. The gray fox has adapted well to this terrain Food and water are not far from its ready-made den in the rocks. The wider ranging coyote is an opportunist, like the raven. Its territory overlaps that of the gray fox, and the scent of the fresh kill is on the wind. Though the coyote wants to steal the fox's prey, one small rodent is hardly a meal. The fox is a clever competitor, and the coyote would just as soon do away with it as well.
the fox reasserts its right to this territory, urinating to scent mark the boundaries. The coyote, frustrated and still hungry, does the same. The spotted skunk, with its unusual markings, is a common resident of canyon country. It prefers open, brushy terrain, where, like most skunks, it goes about its business unmolested. The coyote is hungry, but not that hungry. It knows better than to get even close. Spotted skunks sometimes give threat warnings before they spray, but sometimes they don't. The water that collects in potholes after storms is precious. But it's not what fills an empty stomach. A fat chucker partridge would be just the thing. Introduced from Asia in the 1930s, these birds have succeeded especially well in dry places. Almost a catch but not quite. By now, the coyote is probably feeling that it's had enough bad luck. But it takes speed and skill to outwit a western diamondback rattlesnake. For the coyote, this will be a well-earned meal. In the Arches area of Utah, once towering cliffs are still being weathered away. Water and wind carve the sandstone into graceful windows, arches, and buttresses. An arch that forms over a stream bed is called a bridge. Many, like Rainbow Bridge, are so awesome that they seem to defy the imagination. But many are also quite fragile. Some of the most spectacular are endangered by dammed up waters that threaten to eat away their foundations. Lake Powell has created such a hazard for Rainbow Bridge. It has also inundated what was once one of America's most secret and beautiful canyons.
Glen Canyon's upper walls still tower over boaters on Lake Powell. And some of its carved out niches and caverns still shimmer with light and shadow. But in this vertical world that once belonged to a wealth of wildlife, there is now only room at the top. During the warm, long summer months, these bats emerge nightly to feed on insects above the water and along the rim rock. The cooler months of autumn are my favorite season at Lake Powell. I enjoy exploring the side canyons and just camping along the shore can lead to some exciting experiences. Hi, honey. Hi. Hi, Dad. It's a great book for you. Can we read to me? Oh, okay. Yeah, this is a good one. It's a bird book. How's it going? Good. After sundown is when most animals are active, and it's fun to switch on a flashlight to see what kind of wildlife might be nearby. This little pinion mouse is scouting around for a piece of chocolate I left out on a rock. I wanted to see what creatures it would attract. But I didn't expect that a wild mouse would be so drawn to chocolate that it would ignore not only my flashlight, but also the presence of my hand. Soft hooting in the distance makes me hope that this little guy will show more fear when an owl flies overhead. The next morning, we discover that the pinion mouse was not our only nighttime visitor. My wife Diane's watch is missing. Since I had spotted a pack rat's nest near our campsite the day before, I have an idea who the culprit might be. Just as I thought, there's the watch and a collection of other shiny objects stashed in a nest of twigs beneath a small ledge. Pesky little rascal. I wonder if it had traded ordinary pebbles for the spoon and fishing lure, just as it had for Diane's watch. The pack rat's nest under the ledge echoes the cliff dwellings built in this area by Anasazi Indians over a thousand years ago. These ancient people of the canyons left behind petroglyphs, 
rock drawings of animals and symbols which record their deep respect for the natural world. What modern man leaves behind tells a different story. Majestic, empty spaces like Monument Valley bear silent witness to the forces that shaped Earth's beautiful surface. Hopefully, they will remain uncluttered by anything but clean wind and cloud shadows. Across northern Arizona stretches the most magnificent canyon of all, the Grand Canyon. In the vertical mile from its rim to its floor are found all the life zones from Canada to Mexico. While spring flowers bloom at the bottom of the canyon, the rim and the side canyons may still be frozen deep in winter. This is the country of the cougar. It is also home for the little ringtail, cousin of the raccoon. Though normally nocturnal, occasionally a ringtail may be caught away from its den in the early morning hours. The ringtail is an expert climber. It's completely at home in a cottonwood tree. The big cat is agile and supple, a superb hunter. But climbing trees is not its favorite way to get a meal. And the ringtail is not its favorite quarry. The cougar seldom goes out of its way to hunt small animals. Instead, it depends on a keen sense of smell and patient stealth to stalk the larger prey it prefers, desert bighorn sheep, and above all, mule deer. By the 1920s, man had destroyed most large predators around the Grand Canyon. The result was a classic case of deer overpopulation. On the Kaibab Plateau on the Grand Canyon's north rim, tens of thousands of deer starved to death in less than a decade. Today, the deer herd and their range are back in good condition.
In recent years, we have come to accept the role of our valuable predators, and we have shown increasing respect for this wild and ancient land by simply letting nature take its own course. Even more than most wild places I've been, here I get the feeling of what it would be like to be the first person on Earth, or the last. When a gray fox darts like a shadow from rock to rock, it seems to be the only gray fox in the world. When a canyon wren calls, you wonder if there's another one for a hundred miles. But in reality, just as these mazes of canyons lead from one into another, so it is with the remarkable ecosystem that has evolved here. Living things may be fewer and farther between, but as with everything in nature, they're all interconnected. Each one depends for survival on its fellow Canyon creatures. I'm Marty Stauper. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.